Hey there, welcome to another video here on this Esoteric Circle YouTube channel. I am Pete Haskins, and wherever you were at on your journey, blessings to you. Just wanted to um, come to you tonight with um, a little reading and a little talk on on a book that we're going to be studying starting on December 3rd on our Discord channel. So if you are interested in this and a really fascinating um, take on... A, a combination of Orthodox Christianity and the Fourth Way. This is it. So this is uh, a different Christianity by Robin Amos, and he was my mentor. So I uh, want to offer this to you. So if you're interested in this, uh, please give me a, um, a message in the the comments here on this. Um, and we're going to be starting a study, a deep study of this. Going to be teaching this every other week for the next year, probably, maybe a little more. So anyway, whatever, uh, whatever you'd like, it's uh, just great having you here. And there's a lot of stuff going on on our Discord channel. Really solid group of people. So if you're looking for a group as well, who are very serious uh, about this esoteric journey um, and this hero's journey that you are on, uh, please let me know. So just great having you here. Thank you so much for being here. I want to give you a glimpse into some of the early chapters um, in a different Christianity. And uh, Robin took 60-some-odd uh, trips to Mount Athos in Greece. And he was considered a, a fellow worker on one of the, in, uh, one of the monasteries there. And this was really to... Um, uh, answer the call to what Ospensky told some of his students toward the end of his life that really the key to all the fourth way teaching, and I'm paraphrasing and forgive me if I'm taking liberty with this quote or this idea, but Ospensky really said the the key was Mount Athos, and that's where the the core of these they had multiple monasteries on this Mount Athos, which is a, a peninsula um, in the Aegean Sea, and um, fascinating history of of Mount Athos how it was really independent when the when the Turks uh, took over and conquered um, uh, Byzantium in the 15th century there was a lot of freedom given to Mount Athos and they were allowed to kind of do their own thing so it, it has preserved the core teachings of Orthodox Christianity and it is it is where Robin went so when we're talking about uh, the fourth way and we're talking about um, orthodoxy and the combination of those two, which is what, what Spensky really got, he understood that. Um, Robin is the, is the connection there. And obviously Moraviev knew as well. Um, whoops. So my battery belt went dead. But obviously, Moraviev knew this as well. So, um, and Robin was interested in where Moraviev got his stuff for the three Gnosis volumes. And he had an inkling that there was uh, a certain library there that uh, Moraviev was, had access to. So, some fascinating stuff as, as these, um, the, an investigation to some extent, which is what Robin did. So, um, really want to get into this. So if you're interested in, in diving deeper into this, um, uh, let me know because I really want to share this with you. Um, but want to read this um, read this section here uh, regarding uh, trial by fire. This is in the second chapter of uh, a different Christianity. By thy light we shall see lights as the Orthodox liturgy. If inner religion comes from inner experience, then religion in our times has almost forgotten this key. The inner sense has been lost, or to be more exact, despite the fact that many people have glimpses of an inner life and of its great richness, these glimpses have not been understood, so they have not been put to use. This loss of the inner sense has gone on for a very long time, yet to return to my experiences on Mount Athos, Robin says, which so well illuminate this question, one of, uh, on one of my early visits there, I glimpsed one of the less visible parts of the early tradition of the church when I had a number of interesting and revealing conversations with, a, with my friend Father A. 
All of these talks touched on the question of what happens if the higher faculties are restored in full, even if briefly. One talk of particular importance was in the uh, otherwise empty reception room of the monastery or guest house, where sitting on the cushioned seat running along the windows overhanging the blue-gray sea that Xerxes had once sailed his fleets over, he showed me an icon of the Virgin and the Child. Around the Virgin on this icon, he explained, the prophets were shown, each so as to illustrate one aspect of their story in a way that helped to explain the inner meaning of the birth of Christ. There was Jacob with his ladder, Moses with the burning bush, and so on. Something about this burning bush analogy fell into place, Robin writes. A strange experience was lit up for me, a brief awakening that happened to me on a Christmas Eve many years before. Divine gift received at night after I had tried to spend the whole day dedicated to Christ. As I drifted off to sleep, a blow hit me in the solar plexus. Energy rushed up my spine and out of the crown of my head. Immediately, the world was different, on fire. The interior of objects around me suddenly visible in ceaseless motion. It was then that I first understood Moses' vision on Mount Sinai. Now, more than a decade later, in an ancient monastery 3,000 miles further east, this icon enabled me to fit that experience into its biblical context. The link it established between the Old Testament image of the burning bush and the birth of Christ helped to explain this past experience. From this, I began to understand how the forces existing in our unpurified minds, our fears and wishes, delusions and compulsions, prevent the birth of Christ within our consciousness. Without the purity of heart, that is one of the elements of the wedding garment referred to uh, in the Gospels, without being free from these compulsions, we are not invited to the wedding. The other gospel reference in its inner sense has to do with when the bridegroom comes. Quote, this is from Matthew 3.11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And one symbolic name of the Jewish inner tradition was derived from the chariot of fire, that took the prophets to heaven. Come now, Lord, for your servant awaits you. But when this experience first happened to me, Robin writes, I was not ready for this coming. Something in me, something that was present in me, at least partly because of my lack of preparation for this event, became very fearful at what was occurring. The fear caused inner tensions and with those tensions, the experience, the state of consciousness came to an end. Years later, seeing that icon in the guest house over the windblown Aegean, I began to formulate questions about this event. And this, of course, caused us to move on to the discussion of experiences. Stillness, the emotional stillness of Hezekiah, the word used by fathers such as St. Gregory Palamas for the emotional stillness found in prayer, seems a very important factor in all the more significant experiences. But something else was also necessary, an abundance of energy of a certain kind that comes from a, such experiences. Dynamis, D-Y-N-A-M-I-S, dynamis. Palamas' term for energy, then defined by change almost exactly as it is in Newtonian physics. Dynamis and potential, dynamis as change, dynamis comes to rest again. The fear of the unfamiliar that ended that experience is a commonplace on the inner path. Much esoteric work takes the form of a struggle against that fear. Our reaction to such an experience illuminates the fact that to enter a different form of life, we ourselves must become different. We inhabit a fallen world, and we are trapped there because we ourselves are fallen. But who within us is it that is afraid to step out into the sunlight? We can learn to understand that this is not I. This is one route to humility. 
But this understanding must include a remembrance that to say that we are fallen is also to say that our uh, proper place in life is higher. This relates directly to the following passage, on a uh, gospel passage on the importance of humility. This is from Luke 14, 10 through 11. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then thou shalt have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. But whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Why did I suggest that what ended that experience was fear? Observation shows that something in us fears any glimpse of higher realities. Even the faintest, which would be much less powerful than the one I am describing, is this not the same thing that fears the uncertainties of the night, that fears anything we cannot control, the fear that drives men to become ever richer and to try to dominate others, to hide from the world, to pretend, to lie, when we attempt to serve God and attempt this realistically, realizing that to do so will bring an end to our partial or, or even purely imaginary control over what happens to us, then something in us resists mightily. I continually meet this problem in myself, the unpredictable, the uncontrollable. Anything that I do not understand, all of this threatens the pretense of control that I present to the world. And all of this is to be avoided, if necessary, violently. Observation of the inconsistencies in our nature and the differences between our avowed aims and the moment-to-moment -moment purposes for which we strive shows us that something that has developed in us over the years has developed a life and a sense of identity all its own and fears to lose this life. Perhaps it sees the loss of its control over events as tantamount to loss of this identity. Of this I am not sure, but I am very sure of the fear. You know, as we study this, and, and this is just the beginning, I just want to give you a little, little taste of this. You know, we're talking about experience. You know, we're talking about in search of the miraculous. We're talking about what uh, what Moraviev says is savoir faire, you know, to be put to use, to be able to be used, to be practical. We have to have a change that comes over us. We can't just put another mask on, which most of us with Christianity, whether we go to church, whether we're a preacher or not, it's just a mask. I want to be changed. I want to experience this. I want to know what this is like. You know, I want to know what these guys in the Bible experienced. I want that. Do you want that? I want that. I want to know. I don't want to have some preacher tell me about it. I don't want to have some book tell me about it. I want to know what this is like. I want to experience this. I've experienced some of these things he's talking about. Because I went through suffering and I went, I went through pain. Because I realized what a farce my life was how much of an actor I was and how full of myself I was. And I faced that reality and I realized how shallow I was and how I just desired to look holy and smart. And that's all I really cared about. That's all I really cared about. And I faced the, and some of my failures, they were the greatest gift to me because they revealed myself to me. And through that, through that came these experiences. And he's right. They are fearful experiences. They're very fearful. There's something to be afraid of. There's something to be afraid of. Later on in this chapter, uh, chapter two, the burning bush, Robin goes on to uh, talk a, a little bit about uh, a guy named Carl Jung. Anybody hear about Carl Jung, in uh, this little section here called Modern Man's Inability to Remember Inner Experience. 
writes, a modern way of looking at the fall is that of C.G. Jung, who described how the loss of contact with the inner life today has had very widespread effects on our outer life. It also acts like a, like a self-fulfilling prophecy, creating situations and attitudes which prevent the investigations that would recover this kind of knowledge and the natural human capabilities that give rise to it. In simple terms, it seems that our lack of persistence on the esoteric path, like our apparent lack of knowledge of the inner world, comes from the inability to register and remember inner experience. This is a direct result of what is known as the fall taken in its traditional psychological meaning. This becomes an explanation of how we have become almost inextricably caught in external life so that we have neither time nor attention for anything inward. In this situation, it is not our awareness of the inner life, the inner spirit, that is lost first. What goes first is our ability to register it and so remember it. But this leads to an external view of the inner teachings and turns the morality of the inner tradition into a kind of external legalistic code for which the Pharisees were famous. But this loss of the inner sense has been developing for a very long time. And now our inner lives are not simply unnoticed as regard as subjective and thus unreal, but they have become largely unseen. St. Simeon today is regarded as one of the source theologians of the Orthodox Church. It sometimes seems as if a few really understand what he was trying to convey in this particular section of his writings, but those who have experienced this light will begin to understand. So this this inner experience that he's talking about, it runs all through this first this chapter, first and second chapter. Is, is that what you want? Is that kind of the, the kind of experience that you want? Are you just tired of hearing stories about this? Because, you know, in this, this new age that we're entering, this age of the Holy Spirit, we're, uh, the prophets say that we're not going to have revelation. But we're going to be forming groups and we're going to be forming folks who are getting this these experiences firsthand. And each one of us has to have experience. And we need to know how to register it and remember it. Right? And that's what we're after here. So, this study of a different Christianity by Robin Amos, we're going to be talking about this. We're going to be talking about how to remember it, how to register it, how to allow it to um, be experienced in your life. And this experience of the inner life is so different than anything you have ever experienced. But at the same time, there's going to be a recollection of it, a remembrance of it, that you say, ah, I remember this. And we will learn together not to be afraid of it. And we will learn to not be afraid of it. And we will allow God's Spirit to work through us and guide us out of the cave and guide us toward the light. Because that's what God promises us. Blessings to you. Good evening. Welcome to another video here on the Cesenteric Circle YouTube channel. I'm Pete Haskins. And wherever you're at are on the... Uh, resources, resources.